Good morning, New Life Baptist Church. <clears throat> We're looking at the book of uh, Philemon at the moment. And look at verse number 11. Philemon, verse number 11. It says, Which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. The title for the sermon this morning is Unprofitable, but now profitable. Okay, so unprofitable, but now profitable. And so um, if you look at there, look, let's start with verse number one, of course. Philemon, verse number one. It begins by saying, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. And so what I like about uh, this epistle is we've got the Apostle Paul in prison. He is uh, under house arrest, and he's writing this letter or this epistle to Philemon. And so this is a, a, a long-distance communication, right? And um, obviously, uh, today, I can't be with you. Um, and I have the pleasure of being able to preach for you this morning. But thank God for the technology that we do have. Hey, we don't have to write this in a letter and send it by the hand of a man, but we can get this uh, straight onto the internet and onto YouTube. So I hope it's all a blessing to you uh, this morning. And we are uh, starting obviously a new book here in our Bible study. Uh, we are looking at Philemon, and then we'll be doing three more Psalms after Philemon before we get into a new book. And so, <clears throat> What this is obviously about, and, and why I title it Unprofitable, but Now Profitable, I wanted you to consider your own Christian life, your own walk with the Lord. You know? Would you look at your life and, and say, you know what, my life is profitable to the Lord. My life is profitable to New Life Baptist Church. My, my life is profitable to the brethren. You know, is, is my life profitable to my family? You know, am I a profitable father? Am I a profitable mother? You know, am I profitable children? Do my parents look at me and uh, do they see profit in me? Am, am I benefiting the family or am I unprofitable? You know, am I profitable in my workplace? And, and whatever your, your scenario is, whatever your life is, are you profitable to those around you or are you unprofitable? And so when we look at uh, Paul, we see him immediately here, you know, in prison, as I said, and he's writing this epistle and it's recorded for us in the word of God. You see, one amazing thing that we learn about Paul is it, it doesn't matter what situation he found himself in, he was always profitable. And I'm going to read to you from Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 11. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 11, it says, Not that I speak in respect of want, this is these words, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Okay? So Paul says, I have learned. Whatever state I find myself in, whether I'm a free man or if I'm in prison, whether I have abundance, you know, in, in prosperity or riches, or whether I'm in need, it doesn't matter. He's found himself to be able to be content in whatever situation of life he found himself in. And when you start with that principle of being content no matter where you are, how you are, what situation you find yourself in, that's the beginning steps of becoming somebody that is profitable, okay, profitable to others. Instead of being a whiner, a complainer, always negative, you know, always just, you know, being, uh, you know, I guess, uh, yeah, but being negative to the people around you, you know, we want to be people that profit others. We want to be people that profit the Lord. And I think it's amazing that even though Paul was in prison, he was able to write uh, for uh, prison epistles. You know, the four uh, epistles, number one is the book of Ephesians, number two it's Philippians, then Colossians, and then finally uh, Philemon. And so God was still able to use him, whatever state he found himself in, uh, to do uh, the Lord's work. And, you know, he was profitable, obviously. And today, even in 2021, we are now looking at the epistle of, of Philemon, and the works of Paul are still profitable to others. They're profitable to our church this morning so we can learn more about what the Lord wants from us. The reason I read to you Philippians 4.11 is because um, you can see that Paul says, for I have learned, okay? This was a learning process for him. He didn't start, you know, uh, his, his uh, Christian life as someone that was necessarily profitable. He realized he needed experiences. He needed the challenges. He needed persecutions. And he needed all of this to be able to learn how he can be, uh, remain to be profitable no matter what state he found himself in. And so the first point that I have for you this morning, in order for you to be profitable, you must be willing to learn or to work toward it. 
okay? You have to be willing to learn or work toward being profitable. You know, some people I've come across in my life, you know, there are some people that are just unteachable, unteachable. Now, I hope they change that about themselves, but if you're unteachable, you're never going to improve. You're never going to profit others. You're never going to get better. To be teachable means that you have to be willing to look at your own life and say, hey, there are some things that I'm not doing very well in. There are some things I'm doing very poorly at, and sometimes the Lord may send people your way. Hey, you might be preaching behind the pulpit. It might be your family. It might be friends. It could be the wounds of a friend, right? Uh, some, some harsh words. And they may point out areas in your life that you need to uh, fix, all right? And in order for you to learn, you must be willing to be humble enough to take on board the advice of people around you. Okay, and to use the scenarios where you've done wrong, where you've made mistakes, to be able to acknowledge within yourself, I did wrong, I can do better. You see, if, if you allow pride to just be in your life and you, know, you personally believe nobody can tell me whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong, or you know, I'm not willing to take on anybody's critical advice, then you're not going to be profitable to anybody. You're, you're not going to be profitable to the Lord. You're not going to be profitable to yourself. Okay, and you know, the Lord is calling us to be profitable people. So we have to be willing to learn to work toward being profitable. We may find ourselves right now in an unprofitable state. Well, I want you by the end of this sermon to know what you have to do in order to become profitable. Let's look at verse number two. So this, is a, this epistle was written by Paul to uh, Philemon, which is why it's called Philemon. Okay, and um, it says in verse number two, and to our beloved Apaphia and um, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Now this Archippus, this is not the first time that he's mentioned in the Bible. If you can keep your finger there and go to Colossians chapter 4 for me, please. Go to Colossians chapter 4. Because I, I believe Archippus here um, is the person that, uh, that helps us to understand what church Paul is writing to, okay? We know that this epistle is to Philemon, but the question is, well, what church is Philemon part of, okay? And so if you turn to Colossians chapter 4, and the fact that I'm getting you to turn to Colossians chapter 4 would pretty much show you straight away that I believe Philemon was a member of the church in Colossae, okay, in the Colossian church. But look at Colossians chapter 4 and verse number 17. Paul writes these words, it says, And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. And so my understanding of Colossians here is that Archippus is most likely the pastor, or at least a man with, with, with um, some authority in that church, where they're meeting in his house and he's been given a specific ministry in the Lord. It's, it's been pointed out to him. And you can see Paul is encouraging him, hey, fulfill the ministry that you're doing. It sounds like Archippus at this point in time may have been a little discouraged in the ministry. And, you know, sometimes pastors do get discouraged in the ministry and um, it can be a little bit uh, lonely sometimes. It can be a little bit challenging sometimes. Um, you know, there's, there's always uh, critics into, you know, with how you're, you're trying to manage the church. People are willing to, you know, criticize you and maybe not really give you anything, any good counsel or good advice. And th this is just part of being a pastor and it can become discouraging from time to time. So you can see Paul here just encouraging Archippus to fulfill the ministry that God has given him. And so if Archippus is part of the Colossian church, possibly the pastor here, then we can understand when we read Philemon, why Archippus, our fellow soldier, is mentioning this, and to the church in thy house. And so it would make sense to me that if Paul is writing to Philemon, who is a member of this church, that is also writing this letter to Archippus, so Archippus can read this as the pastor to help oversee, to help um, encourage Philemon in the task that Paul wants him to be part of. Okay, now let's go to verse number three in Philemon, verse number three. The Bible reads, Grace to you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers. So who is it that Paul is always mentioning in his prayers? Philemon, okay, Philemon. And so you can see that Philemon holds a special place in Paul's heart. Philemon, um, it said there in verse number, uh, verse number one, said unto Philemon, our dearly beloved. And so he has, a, he has a great love for Philemon. 
I think we'll, we'll find out later in this book that Philemon is a convert of Paul. Paul actually got Philemon saved, and that's why he's so close to him and can see his growth and, and that he's a beloved to Paul. But the next words that Paul will have in this letter toward Philemon is to prepare Philemon to receive an ex-employee, an, an, a servant, basically. Well, it's not really an ex-employee. It's a servant that has run away, okay? And the servant's name is Onesimus. Okay, we'll have a look at this soon. And so Paul wants Philemon to receive Onesimus with gentleness and love. And so we can see in this letter that Paul is being very careful. It is a very delicate situation where there's been some conflict between a, a, a master and his servant. The servants run away from the work. And Paul wants Philemon to receive that servant back into his employment. So let's look at verse number five. It says, hearing of thy love and faith. So Paul says to Philemon, I've heard of your love and your faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. So that's a great attribute or great characteristic to have, isn't it, Philemon? That he, you know, he's, he's known for his love for the Lord Jesus Christ and is also known for the love that he has toward all the believers. And that's really important because in verse number 6 it says that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. And so because Philemon had this great love and was very faithful toward Jesus and to the saints, it was also the, res the end result of that is that every good thing that he did was in Christ Jesus. You see, he was able to accomplish great works for God. He was able to be, you know, do good works uh, for the Lord because of the love that he had. And so this brings me to point number two. In order for us to be profitable, you first must love Jesus and all his saints. You must first love Jesus and all his saints before you can become profitable to the Lord. Okay? The, the source of your productivity ought to be the love that you especially have to Jesus Christ. You know, the, the reason I can be sacrificial in, in church and pastoring and, and traveling is because of my love toward Jesus, it is because of my love toward the saints, to the brethren. You know, I, I, if I didn't love the brethren, if I did not love Jesus, don't you think that would restrict how much I'm willing to do for the Lord, how much I'm willing to do for God's house, for the church, you know, how much I'm willing to sacrifice, how much I'm willing to travel, all these things, you know, I, I would not be able to do good works as a pastor if I just did have, if I had no love for the Lord, right? If I had no love for his people. And so in order for us to be profitable, brethren, point number two is that you must first love Jesus and all the saints. Let's keep going. Verse number seven. It says, For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. All right. So you can see um, Philemon, he's a blessing to the saints. Okay, uh, others in the church are able to say, yeah, Philemon, he blesses me. I love his company. I love his fellowship. Right? He refreshes us. He makes us feel edified and loved and appreciated. And it's, it's a great quality to have, you know, Philemon. You know, I'm sure people enjoyed his company. People enjoyed being around him. And so the challenge for us then, brethren, the question for you is, are you a blessing to other believers? Are you a blessing to your brothers and sisters in the Lord? You know, do you find that people enjoy your company, enjoy your fellowship? Okay. Are you profitable to New Life Baptist Church? Are you profitable to the saints? And if you find that, you know, you're lacking in that area, you know, maybe in your Christian life, you're not really being the blessing that you would want to be. You know, you're not really uh, showing that love that you ought to have, then that should bring into question how much you love Jesus Christ. Because you see, what you do to the brethren equates to what you're doing for Jesus Christ. You know, if you're willing to serve the brethren, that demonstrates you do it because you're willing to serve Jesus. You know, everything that we do in our church and amongst brothers and sisters of the Lord will ultimately reflect upon what we've done to the Lord. You know, Jesus Christ taught us this basic, you know, basic principle that if we serve the brethren, we are serving Him. And if we have no desire to serve the brethren, that just shows me that you don't have the love for Jesus that you may think you do have. 
Because if you love Jesus, you would love the brethren, right? If you appreciated Jesus, you would appreciate the brethren. You know, these things come hand in hand. You cannot have one without the other. Verse number eight. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee, that which is convenient, yet for love's sake, I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And so what we see here in verse number 8 and 9 is that Paul is expressing to Philemon that he knows he's about to ask something very difficult from Philemon. You know, if you were an employer and your employee ran away, okay, he did not do the job, he left you know, his employment and left you in a difficult situation where you might have to hire another staff or you know, the, the work has to be shared amongst others so the labor becomes more difficult on, on people. Uh, you, may, you may look at the person, the employee, the servant that ran away and say, you know what, I, I, I never want him to return. You, know, you, you may have that attitude, you know, he's betrayed my trust, he's broken our agreement, why would I want him back? And so it, it is a difficult request to take back a man who's run away from your employment. Okay? And so Paul is, is basically preparing Philemon with this, this difficult task. And, you know, in verse number 8, he says, look, I could be very bold and just tell you, hey, take back the guy, right? But he says, look, I'd rather beseech you. I'd rather come gently and, uh, you know, try to um, influence you and, and motivate you and encourage you to take back this runaway servant Onesimus. Verse number 10, then he says, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. All right, so now we know the topic of the, of the, of the letter here, right? Onesimus, um, it says here, Paul refers to Onesimus as my son, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Of course, Paul did not give birth, physical birth. <laughs> okay, that would be impossible. But what Paul is saying here, he gave spiritual birth to Onesimus. That he led Onesimus to Jesus Christ. He gave Onesimus the gospel. He believed on Jesus Christ. And now, spiritually speaking, he's able to speak about Onesimus as his son. And boy, isn't, isn't Paul profitable? Even in bonds, even in prison, he's still winning souls. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, just, that's just amazing, right? It's amazing that whatever situation he finds himself, right? He could be whining once again. He could be complaining. He could be saying to the Lord, why, why Lord, am I arrested? Why am I in prison? No, you know what? Paul was always ready to preach the gospel, no matter what situation he finds himself in. Okay, no matter what, how bad things might get, when Paul came across a situation where he can give somebody the gospel, he did that. That's part of his ability to be profitable for the kingdom of God. And so the third point that I have for you, brethren, if you want to be profitable to the Lord, you want to be profitable to his kingdom, to his work. Number, point number three is you need to always be ready to preach the gospel. Always be ready to preach the gospel. You know, I, I kind of believe that if I was arrested that my mind would be primarily focused on how do I get out of here, right? How do I argue my case? How do I prove that I'm innocent? I don't think my mind will go toward, well, who here in prison can I give the gospel to? But that's exactly how Paul was, okay? The reason he was able to do so much for God and, and he was able to write so much of the New Testament for us is because he was profitable. The third point, once again, he was always ready to preach the gospel. Are you always ready to preach the gospel? You know, if you find yourself in a situation where you're one-on-one -on -one with someone, a friend, family, colleague, you know, where the doors just open up, are you ready to just ask that person and, you know, see whether they are on their way to heaven, to, to see whether they have believed on Jesus Christ? And if not, to be able to give them the good news of the gospel. Let's keep going, verse number 11. He says, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. So who was unprofitable? Onesimus. Okay, Onesimus was an unprofitable servant, an unprofitable employee. All right, now, I remember when I first, you know, finished up high school and I started to get my first jobs, applying for my first jobs and doing all that, I look back at myself now and I, I just realized, boy, I was an unprofitable employee, right? Like when, when you're new to it, you don't necessarily know how... How to, how to listen, maybe to have a good work ethic, 
right? Or how to communicate. You might be struggling in some of these areas. And again, you need to be able to learn. You need to recognize, man, I did bad here. I need to do better next time, right? And so, yeah, definitely Onesimus was unprofitable, okay? And the story goes, we'll look at this later, he actually ran away from employment. And, um, but now, now, when, when Paul says in verse number 11, but now profitable, why is he profitable now though? What took place? Well, in verse number 10, it's because he got him saved. You know, um, Onesimus now is a believer. He's a Christian, right? He's saved. And so Paul, it's, it's, it's quite interesting because Paul is expecting within Onesimus, now that you are saved, you can be profitable to me and to Philemon. Okay, so you can see there's just this expectation that a believer ought to be more profitable than an unbeliever. Now, you know, for those of you that work, you know, in, uh, in your secular jobs, you know, you might be the only one that's saved and there's other people there that are unsaved. My question, my challenge to you, when you look at your work ethic, when you look at your productivity on the job, are you more profitable than those that are unsaved? Or would you say you might be even less profitable or just about the same? You know, there should be a good expectation amongst believers that you as, a, as an employee or you in your relationships, you as a parent, you as children, you ought to be more profitable than those that are unsaved. That, that ought to be the case. That ought to be the expectation now that you are saved, right? Jesus Christ gave his life for you and he wants you to be the best you can be profitable in whatever scenario whatever life scenario you find yourself in because ultimately whatever we do brethren we do it as unto the lord we do it as serving jesus christ you know i hope you desire to be very profitable i hope you desire to stand out and have a good reputation you know to, to show the world that christians are better workers that Christians are better parents, that Christians have better families, that Christians have better relationships, right? That Christians have greater knowledge. You know, we, we ought to be striving to become more profitable and, you know, just, just better than when we were before we were saved. Now, when I say that, can you please keep your finger there and go to 1 Corinthians, please. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 for me, please. Because I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying here. I'm not saying that, you know, if you become more profitable, that proves you're saved. Okay? Because that's kind of like, you know, the issue with, well, if I don't see the fruits in his life, then I don't think he's saved or, you know, he's not saved. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay? But go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 11. Because there is that false belief, right, in some churches where, you know, if someone gets saved, someone has believed on Jesus, that for some reason, Christians like to doubt it. Well, I've got to see how well he lives his life. I've got to see whether he's fruitful. I've got to see if he's interested in the things of God. I've got to see if he starts to clean up his life. And only if I see an improvement, only if I see that he becomes profitable, then I'll know he got saved. That's a false doctrine. Okay? And I'll show you this here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 11. 1 Corinthians 3.11, it says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Look, the only salvation we can get, the only foundation to our salvation is Jesus Christ. Plus nothing, minus nothing. It's Christ's finished work on the cross and our faith, our belief on Him, that one-time faith upon Him, calling upon the name of the Lord, asking Him for salvation, which saves us. It's only on Christ. He is the foundation. But now that we have that foundation, okay, in our Christian life, verse number 12 says, Now, if any man build upon this foundation, that's the foundation of Christ, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try or test every man's work of what sort it is. So our works are going to be judged by God, not for salvation, but to see whether our works were gold, silver, precious stones, or if it was wood, hay, and stubble. Whether our works were things for eternal uh, rewards or eternal value, or whether our works were just temporary things, right? Uh, earthly things that hold no, hold no eternal value. 
It says in verse number 14, if any man's work abide, that's after the, the fire of judgment passes through, um, which he have built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Praise God. You know, every work you do for the Lord, your service to Jesus Christ, your service to the brethren, okay, any work you do is going to be rewarded by God. As long as it's gold, silver, and precious stones, right? But then it says in verse number 15, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. So he's not going to get the rewards, right? He's going to suffer loss of rewards because all his works was temporal. It was just earthly. You know, he only sought his own best interest rather, the king, rather than the kingdom of God. Well, then all his works shall be burnt. He shall suffer loss. He's not going to get rewarded. But then it says, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So the fire, as it burns all his wood, hay, and stubble, it's going to reveal, once again, what the foundation is, because it's the foundation of Jesus Christ that saves us. Okay. So the point of that passage is it proves to us that you cannot base someone's salvation on how well they're living their life. Whether if they're doing good, if they're being profitable or not, you can't base someone's salvation on that at all. Okay. In fact, somebody can believe on Christ and do nothing for the Lord, do, do no works of, of eternal value, be like this person, comes before God on judgment day, all his works are burnt up, but it reveals the foundation of Jesus Christ and he's saved. Okay? So that's not what I'm teaching. I'm not saying that every saved person will automatically be profitable. Because point number one was, once again, you have to be willing to learn. You, you need to do the hard work. You, you have to be willing to change yourself to become a profitable person. Can you please turn to Ephesians chapter 2? Turn to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 8. A very popular portion of scripture that we often use when we go soul winning. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 8. You probably all know it off by heart. Which says, for by grace are you saved through faith. So how are we saved? Through our faith. And that not of yourselves, so it's not me. It is the gift of God. So it's a free gift. Salvation is a free gift. Then it says, not of works lest any man should boast. So if salvation was by works, God is saying that man would boast. I'm going to heaven because I'm such a good person. right? I, I gave money to the poor and I give to charity and I just do the best I can to my fellow man, to my fellow neighbor. And that's, that's boastful. To think you're going to heaven based on your works is boastful. God does not want us to boast of ourselves. He wants us to boast of Jesus Christ. Okay? But even though salvation is not by works, look at verse number 10. It says, Ephesians 2.10, For we are, now that we are saved, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that, look at this, we should walk in them. Okay, so now that we're saved, we have the new man in us, well, that new man has been ordained by God to do good works, to do uh, works of eternal value, right? To get those heavenly rewards, to be able to lay up our treasures in heaven. God has ordained that for the new man, okay? So we should walk in them. And why, you know, the point here is that before we were saved, we cannot walk in these good works that God would have us to do. We can only do those good works we can only be profitable once we are saved. And so there should be this expectation that if you are saved, you are now doing the good works, okay, that God has asked us to do. God has given us the ability. He's given us His Holy Ghost. He's given us His Word. He's given us church. He's given us the, 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 uh, all, all the resources we need in able to walk in accordance to the works that He has created us to do. And that, you know, when you do those things, that's when you become profitable unto the Lord. Onesimus, before he got saved, was unprofitable to God. He was unprofitable to his employee. Uh, sorry, his employer. Okay? But now that he's saved, Paul the Apostle expected Onesimus to be better, to be profitable. Not just to him, to the Lord, yes, but also to his former employer to return back and get back into the job. And so... This is something I truly believe. Like, I, I don't just say this. I, I really believe this. You know, this is something I had to learn as well in my Christian life. I truly believe that all Christians, everyone that is truly saved, should be just better people in general, better in their community, better in their workplace. 
you know, better in the family relationships, okay? I mean, I always wanted to make sure that as an employee, I just did the best, I worked the hardest, right? I mean, I may not necessarily have been the smartest on the job, right? I may not necessarily have been the most productive, but the effort was there, right? We're, we're all limited in the, the abilities that we have, but there was no doubt from my employer's minds that I was given everything that I could. Right? I was trying to be a model employee. I'm not saying these things to, to puff myself up, but this should be how Christians behave. We ought to be looking, how can I be profitable to those that are around me? How can I be profitable like Onesimus to Philemon? And uh, one of my favorite passages in the scriptures, and I've, I've, I've probably taught on this many times already, but it's Colossians chapter 3. You might want to turn there actually. Colossians chapter 3. Now remember, Philemon was a member of the church, um, to the Colossian church. Okay, so we're not too far from the teaching there. In Colossians chapter 3, in verse number 22. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 22. It says, Servants, so Onesimus was one of these servants. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleases but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Amen. So, employers, employees, I should say, employees, you know, if you work for some boss, okay, you're not really working for that boss. It says, for ye serve the Lord Christ. When you go to work on Monday, okay, I want you to have your mindset that I am working for Christ today. When you go into work on Tuesday, I am working for Christ. Consider the whole week, the whole month. Consider every day that you are in employment as an employee or as a servant to some master and say, you know what, I'm just going to work as though I'm just serving Christ. As though Christ has given me this instruction, how well would I serve Christ if he asked this from me? And boy, you have that mindset, right? Instead of pleasing men, you seek to please God. You have that mindset, you will be profitable, guaranteed. God's going to give you the ability, you know, to be able to work hard and not work in this flesh, but to be energized by the new man, by the leading of the Holy Ghost, to be productive on your job, to stand out before others, okay? And, and that's what, again, Paul expected from Onesimus, that he considered, yeah, he, he used to be unprofitable, but now, now that he's saved, he's profitable. Because Paul knew that, you know, he's got the new man, you know. And if he walks in accordance to the new man, walks in accordance to the ways of God, setting Christ as his master rather than some man, then he will definitely be profitable. Let's go back to Philemon, verse number 12. Philemon, verse number 12. Paul says, Whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him that is mine own bowels. All right. So Paul is saying, look, I got Onesimus saved. Okay. But I'm sending him back to you. Right. Whom I sent again. So Onesimus is actually carrying this epistle. He's carrying this letter with him when he goes to see uh, Philemon. And, uh, you know, not only would it be difficult for Philemon to receive this runaway servant or to maybe even, you know, he may want to press charges because things were different back then. It's not like now where you can kind of give your two week notice and quit a job. You know, the, the, in, the, in the time of the Bible here, uh, with, with believers and, and the Jews, you, you, you basically took on a, a, a position of a servant if you worked for somebody, okay? In fact, if, I believe I have the reference here. Yeah, can you please turn to Exodus chapter 21? Turn to Exodus 21, please. Exodus 21. But while you turn to Exodus 21, I just want to show you that Paul is sending Onesimus back. So yeah, it's hard for Philemon to take back this unprofitable servant, but wouldn't it also be hard for Onesimus to face, you know, the guy that he did wrong to, okay? To go back to the employment, the workplace where he ran away from. So Onesimus is shown good character to take this instruction from Paul and to go back to his master. And so the next point that I have for you, point number four, to be profitable, brethren, is to stop running away from your responsibilities. Stop running away from your responsibilities. And I just want to talk to the fathers right now. You are the head of your wife. You are the head of your home. And I, I say this all the time because I just feel like we live in a society 
where men have been, I don't know, just, I was, I was going to say something nasty, but <laughs> I won't say it. You know, men have just basically become weak, right? That they've been overrun by their wives, right? Uh, instead of them issuing instructions to their children, they're doing anything their children want, right? Instead of being leaders and taking ownership, instead of taking the responsibilities, they'd rather dish it out to somebody else. Right? Instead of handling problems in their own family, they'd rather run to the pastor and try to get the pastor to sort those things out. It's not the pastor's job. You know? it's, it's the husband. You are the head of your family. Okay? And you've got responsibilities. These are the people that God has put you up, uh, um, over, your wife and your children. Okay? You are responsible for these people before God. You know? and, and sometimes I see in our society just men trying to run away from that when actually, when you take ownership, when you take responsibility of what God has given you, it's going to make you a happy person. It's going to give you satisfaction. It's going to make you feel, boy, you know what? This is what God has given me, and I'm doing a great job. I'm being profitable to God here. I'm being profitable to my family here. I'm leading them in the right ways. I'm leading them in godly ways. It makes a huge difference to your life. We need to be people that don't run away from our responsibilities. You know, if you're on the workplace and things get tough, don't be a quitter. You know, don't quit. Now, look, I'm not saying there's never a time to step away from a position. I'm not saying there's never a time to quit a job, you know, and uh, find something else. You know, th those times come. But I'm talking about people that have a pattern of quitting, right? Where, where they take on a job and it's, oh, it's too hard, they quit. Take on another job, it's too hard to quit. Take on another job, oh, it's too far away. Take on another job, oh, it's too much training. Take on another job, oh, it's too little pay. And it's just constant quitting, 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 right? And, and, and they're never able to accomplish anything. They're never able to be productive. You know, we need to learn from Onesimus and say, you know what? No, I've got responsibilities and I've got to go and I've got to stop running away from that, right? So this, this wasn't easy for Onesimus to do either. You know, we have to be willing to change and to learn and to grow. I got you to turn to Exodus 21. Look at verse number 1. Exodus 21 and verse number 1. It says, Now these are the judgments, judgments which thou shalt set before them. If thou buy an Hebrew servant. This is not a slave. Okay, it's a servant. Six years he shall serve, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. Okay, this is not slaves. Okay. What God is saying is, look, if you buy a Hebrew servant, okay, so this Hebrew, this other person, is willing to sell himself into servitude, right? He may have bills to pay. He might be in a tough financial situation. So he offers himself, he sells himself, and they make a six-year contract, maximum six years. It doesn't have to be six years, okay? But it can be six years. But at the end, on the seventh year, he has to go out, okay? It ends, the, con the, the employment contract ends, all right? So this is not slavery, because slavery, you know, they would never let the slaves go, right? And the, slaves doesn't, and the slave doesn't have a choice whether he wants to sell himself for employment or not, okay? Now, this is a servitude. But you can see here that the servant, okay, you know, was not able to just give two weeks' notice. You know, if they had agreed to six years, he would be under servitude for that master for six years, all right? So I just want to show you that, that you know, this is the master-servant relationship in the Bible. And, you know, it, it's kind of similar, I, I guess, where, you know, I, I, I worked once where I signed a contract and it was just a 12-month contract, you know, and, um, you know, I felt obligated, obviously, to see out that 12, month, 12 months and, and uh, you know, I would not be fired unless I really messed up, you know, during that 12-month period. And so it's something similar to a set contract period, right? But the master basically had complete ownership over that servant over that period of time. And so the fact that Onesimus ran away, it wasn't that he just quit some job, okay? He was still under servitude, like legally, it was still a legal, legally binding agreement that they had between master and servant, okay? So Philemon was probably in his right to maybe press charges, right, to get um, Onesimus arrested, thrown in jail or something like that, which is why Paul the Apostle steps in Right? and tries to bring um, you know, a resolution, a reunion between the master and the servant here. Look at, go back to Philemon, look at verse number 13. Philemon, verse number 13. Paul says about Onesimus, whom I would have retained with me, 
that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. So Paul is saying, look, Philemon has become profitable to me. He's already helping me in the ministry. I would like to keep him here with me and, and helping me serve. And if I did that, he would be doing it in your stead because Philemon owns Onesimus. So if Onesimus is serving Paul, basically Philemon, because he's the master, is serving Paul as well. Like, so so Phile- um, Onesimus is, is, would be serving Paul in Philemon's stead. I hope I, got those names. I didn't get those names mixed up, okay? And uh, let's keep going, verse number 14. But then he says this. So he says, look, it would have been good to just keep Onesimus with me. But then he says in verse number 14, but without thy mind, okay, or without your agreement, Philemon, would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. All right. So this is another thing that I like about Paul here, and it shows us again uh, the ability to be profitable. What is it that you find here in Paul? He's got another man's servant, okay? He's got him saved. But he realizes that Philemon is the master, okay? Philemon has authority over Onesimus. So Paul is not trying to take advantage of the fact that he has Onesimus here, who he could use for his ministry. He recognizes the authority of Philemon over Onesimus, okay? So the next point that I have for you is you must, in order for you to be profitable, you must honor or respect authority. You must honor and respect authority. Look, I promise you this. If God sees you honoring authority, respecting authority, following the instructions, as long as, as, long as it's not sinful or wrong, right? Following the instructions that you're, the person in, in authority has um, given you, then your opportunities to become, to be someone in authority will be given to you in your return. Like if, if you're a bad follower, if you have no respect for authority, why would God put you in a position of authority? Why would God promote you? You know, if you can't do it yourself, right? And so you must honor or respect authority. Now, sometimes people mix this up a little bit because I'll just quickly read to you from Colossians 3.25. It says, uh, But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he have done, and there is no respect of persons. And we also know that God is not a respecter of persons. So when I say to you respect authority, the need to respect authority to be profitable, I'm not saying that you respect one person above another. If someone does wrong, it doesn't matter what their position is, they should be corrected for the wrong that they've done, right? If someone's committed a crime, it doesn't matter if it's some, uh, you know, scumbag who, you know, some drunkard, you know, low life, or if it's some guy in government, if it's the prime minister himself, if they've done the same crime, they've done the same wrong, they deserve to have the same punishment, regardless of who they are, okay? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about authority, people in authority, people that you have in your workplace, your boss. You ought to honor him, okay? When it comes to the government, we ought to re- honor our politicians, okay? Again, it's not about the individual, it's their office that we're talking about here. You know, children, you ought to respect and honor your parents. Again, it's the position. Your parents aren't perfect. I'm a parent, I'm not perfect, right? I mean, we're not saying respect the individual person necessarily but the office, the position, right? I'm the pastor of New Life Baptist Church. You know, there should be a healthy respect and honor to that office. And, you know, I appreciate it that you guys do that for me. It's not a problem. But if you want to become profitable, okay, the person who's your master, the person who's in authority over you, when they see that, they res- that uh, when you respect them, they're going to they're gonna, you know, appreciate you as, a, as an employee or whatever situation, relationship you find yourself in. They're going to appreciate that and maybe promote you, you know, give you a lot of benefits, give you a lot of wiggle room, a lot of freedom to do things when they see you to be a person who is pr- uh, profitable to them and respects their authority. Some people think it's very manly to be rebellious against authority. And it's so, so contrary to the scriptures. You know, in uh, 1 Samuel 15, verse 23, it says, For rebellion is as sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity of idolatry. Witchcraft. Rebellion. Rebellion against authority is seen by God like witchcraft. Is that what you want to be considered with God by God? I mean, if God looks at you as some rebellious person against authority, do you think he'll consider you to be profitable or unprofitable? Definitely unprofitable, right? And of course, God is the ultimate authority, 
and he's put us under the authority of other people in, the, in this world, he's allowed that. It's, these are his institutions. These are his powers that he's put in place. We need to just learn how to honor and respect the authorities that are over us. Back to Philemon, verse number 15. Philemon, verse number 15. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever. But now, sorry, not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. All right, so what do we learn here? That um, obviously Onesimus departed, he ran away, but Paul is saying, hey, you know, okay, he departed for a brief period of time, but maybe now you guys can be friends forever. Now that he's changed, he got saved, he's been profitable, all right? Hey, he left as a servant, and now he's a brother in the Lord. So what do we see there from somebody that's a profitable? The next point that I have for you, brethren, in order for you to be profitable, is think of the bright side, okay? Or think positive. You know, when things go bad, are you thinking about the negative? Are you just whining again and complaining, and you know, everything's bad? Or are you trying to find the positives in that situation? You know, Philemon could look at this and say, well, no, he ran away. You know what? He ran, I, I want nothing to do with him. Paul is saying, hey, he could be there forever. He could serve you forever. You know, if you receive him lovingly and, and you bring him back and you don't press charges against him, right? He may serve you forever. Be grateful forever. Okay? Hey, he left a servant, okay, an unprofitable servant. But now he's coming back, back as a brother in the Lord. He's on his way to heaven. Hey, not only can he help you in the workplace, now he can help you in the ministry of the church. All right? So we can see from Paul, he's thinking positive. He thinks of the bright side, regardless of what situation developed. I hope you can think about things like that. When you're going through some difficulties, some, some challenges, when it just seems like the world is falling apart, are you looking for the bright side? Are you looking pos positively? Are you looking at how God will use these challenges in your life to make you more profitable for him? That's what you need to do, brethren. You need to think on the bright side. Look at verse number 17. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. So Paul is, again, you know, comparing himself as a partner. Partner in, in God's work, right? So this is the idea of teamwork. Teamwork. You know, and, and as I read these next verses, um, I, I, I know where I used to be as an as individual. I never liked teamwork. You know, when, when we used to do, when I was in school and sometimes you had to work on a project, sometimes you, you know, you'd, do a, you'd have to do like an assignment or a project on your own, or sometimes you'd have to do things as a team. I never liked teamwork, because I felt like everyone's going to let me down. <laughs> or I just let down other people, all right? But, you know, teamwork is important, especially if you want to become profitable. Let's keep reading, verse number 18. If ye have wronged thee, or oweth thee ought, put that on mine account. Paul is so confident that Onesimus is going to be profitable. He says, look, you know what? If he owes you money, if he's stolen anything or, you know, done something wrong to you, um, you know, you've missed out on, you know, whatever. Paul says, you know what? Put that on my account. I'll, I'll pay for it. I'll take care of it. Verse number 19. I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. I will repay it. Albeit, I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thine own self besides. So he says, look... You know, I'm willing to pay whatever Onesimus has done wrong to you. But it's kind of reminding Philemon, but you know what? I'm, I'm not going to bring to your remembrance how you owe me. And it says, thine own self besides. So he's basically saying, look, I got you saved. <laughs> you know, if, if anyone owes anyone anything here, you know, Philemon, it's you. You know, you are on your way to hell. You know, you did not have salvation. You did not know the gospel. But I've come in. I've given you the gospel. I've gotten you saved right? And so if anyone owes anything, anyone anything, it's, it's the other way around, okay? But Paul, because he's so confident in Onesimus, says, I'm willing to pay anything if, if you know, uh, you, you've missed out financially um, from not having Onesimus there as a servant. Verse number 20, yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refre refresh my bowels in the Lord. Look at this, having confidence. Not only did Paul have confidence in Onesimus, but now he has confidence in Philemon. He says, having confidence of thy obedience, I wrote unto thee. He says, look, I know you're going to, going to be obedient. I'm so confident, Philemon, that you're going to be obedient, that you're going to take Onesimus back into your employee. 
And then he says this, knowing that thou will also do more than I say. Not only will you forgive him and bring him back into your workplace, you're going to do more. I'm so confident you're going to do more. What I really like about this is Paul's, you know, attitude toward others, to others that are laboring with him in, you know, God's business. And the next point that I have for you, brethren, in order for us to be profitable, is you have to have confidence in others. And this is hard. It's hard to trust others, to have confidence in other people. It's, it's a difficult thing. And uh, again, we've seen Paul, he's, he's confident about Onesimus, and he's confident about Philemon. Now, when you show people that you're confident in them, that's going to help them be confident in themselves. You know, if I, you know, in order for me to be able to serve Blessed Oak Baptist Church in Sydney, it, it caused me, it made me have to stop and say, I have to learn to have confidence in other people. You know, I, I need to have confidence that uh, the people in the church at New Life Baptist Church are able to continue the church services running in my absence. That the men that have put their hand up to preach, that they're going to be able to preach, you know, uh, as much as they've claimed to be able to preach. You know, my, my conf- I have to have a level of trust and confidence uh, in others that the song leaders are going to, to lead and, and the, the work, the cleaning, the tidying, that's all going to get done. And, and you know, if, if I didn't have confidence in others, if I could not operate uh, in, in a team environment, then I would not have been able to come to Sydney and to serve Blessed Hope Baptist Church. You know, I'd be holding on to the, to the baby too much, be holding on to the work too much, and never give other people the opportunity to serve God with their lives. You know, for those of you up there that preach on a regular basis because of my absence, you know, I I know it it gets tiring. I know it gets challenging and and difficult. But don't forget you're serving the Lord God. I want you to be profitable to the Lord God. You know, if you're profitable to me. You're you're a blessing to me. When you do work and you labor in in the house of God because of my absence, it's a blessing to me. But most of all, the reason you're able to do it is because of the love you have toward Jesus Christ. You know, you're laying up treasures in heaven. This is a great opportunity to, for, for everybody at New Life Baptist Church to serve one another, to love one another, to see where can I, what can I do, you know, to continue this church going forth and going forward, uh, doing the works of God while our pastor's down in Sydney. You know, these are great opportunities for you to serve Jesus Christ. But you know what? The only reason I was able to come here is because I have confidence in you guys. I, I truly do. You know, I, I dedicated, you know, the first three years with you and i've seen you grow and i've seen you have a heart for the lord and for soul winning and uh you guys were ready you guys were ready to you know keep that church going along even though my you know my influence has greatly reduced you know in the time being while while i'm way down in sydney so i i preach appreciate each one of you guys but you know this allows us when we're able to trust each other when we're able to have confidence in each other for our service toward the lord we're able to do so much more for the lord i'll just read to you ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse number 9 ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse number 9 it says two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor you know what the lord's going to reward us when we stand before the lord god yes the foundation of christ and he sees the service that we've done for New Life Baptist Church and Blessed Hope Baptist Church, you know what? We're going to be able to get that good reward for our labor. Two are better than one. We're going to be able to get greater rewards from God because we've learned to trust each other. We've learned to have confidence with one another, to allow others to serve God and be profitable for Him. Because it says in verse number 10, For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he have not another to help him up. This is why it's so important that we learn to work together in the, in the labor of God, the, the harvest that God has given us. We, we learn to work with one another because when someone gets discouraged, the other person can pick them up. You know, we've had situations where one man can't preach and some other man has stepped up to preach. Right now, I, I'm stepping up to preach, right? Just online for you guys this morning. We, we, we just need to be there to support and encourage one another and we'll be able to do so much more for the Lord. Back to Philemon, Philemon verse number 22. Philemon 22. It says, But with all prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. So Paul is expecting once he gets released out of prison, that he's going to come to Colossae to see Philemon and say, Hey, prepare a place for me. You're the next place I'm going to come and visit, right? 
Verse number 23, There salute thee Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So that's the, the book of Philemon. I think there's a lot of great lessons that we can learn there. You know, the title for the sermon was Unprofitable, but Now Profitable. Brethren, are you more profitable now that you're saved than you were before you were saved? You know, as you've grown in the Lord and matured in Christ, are you more profitable now than you were before? Let me just go through those points once again. What were they? Number one, in order for us to be profitable, you must be willing to learn or to work toward it. Number two, you must first love Jesus and all his saints. Number three, you must be ready always to preach the gospel. Number four, you need to stop running away from your responsibilities. Number five, you must honor or respect authority. Number six, you must think of the bright side, think positively. And number seven, you have to have confidence in others. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Lord, we want to thank you for this opportunity to hear from your word this morning. Thank you, Lord, for helping me prepare something uh, for New Life Baptist Church, even though it's through um, the video system, Lord, and I can't be there in person today. But Lord, I just pray that uh, the words that we've learned from, from Philemon would sink deep down into our hearts and into our ears. And Lord, that we would strive to be more profitable in our labor and our work in whatever opportunity lord we find ourselves in to be able to serve uh, either lord um, yourself and the brethren at church or just in our families in our in our workplaces or whatever environment lord you place us in help us to uh improve lord help us to be better help us to stand out um and lord especially help us to be able to walk in accordance to the to the works that you have laid out for us lord since being saved thank you for giving us the holy spirit thank you for giving us the new man thank you for giving us great instructions in your word that we may be able to think of eternity and lay up our treasures in heaven lord i pray that uh this morning we are blessing to the brethren there and that they would be able to be uh, successful in their soul winning efforts we pray all this in jesus name amen okay thank you brethren <laughs>